All right, welcome back everyone to the second lecture today of BC 111 on faith. We've been uh, discussing on collective faith and we will uh, continue talking about that. All right, let's take some questions. Ren, your question. If we pray collectively, will we see quicker results, quicker answers to prayer? Um, hmm. If we pray collectively, will we see quicker answers to prayer? So, that's an interesting question. I'm just trying to think how to answer that. Will we see quicker answers if we pray collectively? Um, I mean, here's some. Here's my thought. I mean, I, I, uh, I don't, I don't think we can say um, we will always see. Okay, let's look, let's put it like this: that when we when there is collective faith. Right? When we are two or more of us are praying together for a matter, there is um, greater strength, a greater power in that when two of us, two or more of us are agreeing together on that same matter. Okay. So from that perspective, yes, we are going to be able to do more because the Bible does teach us two are better than one. And we read that scripture, Ecclesiastes 4 9. So obviously, two are better than one, or when there are more people in unity or in unison praying for something, it's making greater power available, or, or at least from our place of agreement, it's it's much better. We are in a better position. So from that perspective, yes, it's advantageous for uh people. To be in agreement and in prayer. But at the same time, what I would look at is there are certain things that God will release um, at certain times. I mean, see, he uh, he look he looks for or he has the Kairos moment, the right time to release something. So, example, example. Suppose we are collectively praying for revival. Saying, we are saying, God, we want to see a mighty move of the Holy Spirit. And this has happened in the history of the church many times. So you will learn in your second year when you study church history. Uh, and, and you go to the history of the church, especially uh, the Pentecostal history of the church. You will see numerous times, you know, uh, in the 17th, in the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, there were different groups of people praying, and revival took place. So you will see it happen over and over again in the history of the church, uh, even in India as well, uh, Europe, North America, so many different parts of the world, South America, so many parts of the world. Uh, so if we are praying for, if there's a group of people praying for revival, so the more people coming together praying is important. But then there's also something where, uh, but you can't, you can't fix the time. Okay, we, you all pray for five days and then revival will happen. Or you pray for five months and then revival. What we will see as we look at the history of revivals and, and the history of the church is there is no set formula but God so the people are praying the people are in agreement praying and then God sees you know the right time to release the move or the outpouring of the Holy Spirit so for example the revival in the Hebrides islands I think there were two or three elderly Blind ladies. 
So it wasn't even a big group of people. There's three of them, I think, two or three of them. Uh, one was blind, one was, I think, with arthritis, and so I mean, the elderly people had, you know, said, oh, what can happen? But when these pe people started praying, that eventually gave birth to a revival, a mighty move of the Holy Spirit. The, the hundred year prayer movement that took place among the Moravians, which was a small group of people living in Germany, and they continued praying for 100 years nonstop. It began with a small group of people who, uh, who decided to you know, take turns and pray for 24 hours. And I think the initial group was only about 20 some people. You know, and then they start praying. So again, it's a small group. So, but then it gave birth to something very powerful that today we look back and say, in the history of the church, that was, you know, a turning point that gave birth to what later on came to be known as, you know, the the, the first missionary movement. They impacted many many lives. They sent more missionaries in 100 years than. The church had sent mystery before that in, in a long time. So we, we, we cannot say more people will always expedite things, make things faster. Uh, we can't say that. We, can, we know it is better, it's good, it's more advantageous, but will it make things faster? Uh, I cannot say yes, always, right? Um, I, what I would say is it is better, but it's not that it will always make things happen faster because there is there are other things that God looks at, which is the coming together of situations, coming together of people for which when God will release the answer, especially in the context of revival or seeing those kinds of things happen. Uh, yeah, so my answer to your question is, not always, but it does, it will make a difference, you know, but we can't say always more people answer will be faster, you know, so you can't do that, especially when you look at this to the church. There's no chapter and verse on it, but this, I'm just looking at church history uh, to answer your question. Okay. Any other questions? Another question, Ren, go ahead. It's fine. You can ask 100, 100 questions. No problem. <laughs> yeah. I say say a question again. Um, does it take one person to release the more of the spirit? Or what's your question? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. okay. So we have a question here where the question is: Will the unbelief of one person affect the faith or or, or the move of the spirit? When there are other people in faith, yeah, okay. So we'll come to that. It's in in the lecture notes. We'll come to it, uh, and we will look at biblical examples, and I will give a response to that. Okay. So it's coming up in the next. Good question, Sean. So um, we read that in uh, Acts five fifteen, where uh, Peter's uh, Peter's shadow fell on the sick; they were healed. Actually, uh, you see something similar to that in uh, Second in Second Kings thirteen chapter, where after Elisha's death is um, when uh, nothing left remained but his bones, and another person touched his uh, another man's bone touched his bone, that person came back to life. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so we will. You learn about that in your Holy Spirit course about the anointing. How the anointing operates, flows. Yeah, so we'll see many examples. Go ahead. Oh. 
Okay, let me pick up a question here from Taya. If we are praying for somebody but the person does not have faith or is an unbeliever, will our prayers be answered? So Taya's question is, if we are praying for somebody who does not have faith, will our prayers be answered? Okay, so Taya, I will, um, there is the norm and then there is the exception. The norm, that is a normal way in which we see God working, is that people have to have faith. The person praying and the person being ministered to both have to have faith. So when you look at the ministry of Jesus, you find that uh, all who came to Jesus in faith received healing. And Jesus required that. That was a norm, that people would come to him in faith. So, for example, the blind men who came to him, Jesus asked them in Matthew 9, 27 to 29, Jesus asked them, do you believe that I'm able to do this? You know, so he required faith from people who came to him. That's the norm. But there are also exceptions. The exceptions are, there are times God will move sovereignly independent of faith. So we see that also in the ministry of Jesus. Uh, for example, in John chapter 5, when Jesus was by the pool of Bethesda, and there was this man who had been paralyzed for 38 years, uh, Jesus came to him and he asked him, will you be made whole? Now the man had no idea who was speaking to him. He had no idea that this was Jesus who was speaking to him. And his response was more than the natural. You know, there's nobody who can take me and put me into the water uh, when it is stirred. So he wasn't even having, he wasn't thinking in terms of faith at all. And yet Jesus tells him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And he was healed instantly. So the norm is the person praying and the person being ministered to or receiving prayer both need to be in faith. That's what the Bible teaches us. That's what we see in the ministry of Jesus. But we also see exceptions. That means God moves sovereignly independent of faith uh, on the part of the person being ministered to. So what should we do as people who are ministering? We try to operate according to the norm as far as possible, which is we share the word of God, we teach people on healing so that they can, their faith can be encouraged and they can have faith and they can believe God. So that's the norm. We try to operate in the norm. But we also op are, remain open for exceptions, which means there may be situations you don't have the opportunity to tell the person about Jesus. You may not have the opp opportunity to uh, explain the word of God and build faith, but you still pray knowing that God can move sovereignly to bring healing. So while we not, we would minister according to the norm, this is the way God works, we see in the scriptures, we also stay open to the exceptions, right? So we covered this in detail in our course on ministering healing. Uh, you will learn that in your second year. Uh, I will also refer you to our book, uh, Ministering Healing and Deliverance. Um, there's a chapter there where we... Uh, look at all the norms and exceptions, and I think we list out about seven or eight of them, the norms and exceptions, where this is a normal way we are supposed to minister, which we see in the ministry of Jesus, but there are also exceptions to that, and one of them is faith and the sovereign move of God. I hope that answers the question, Shaya. Okay, we will, and then we will take uh, uh, Vijay's. Anand's question. So, Vijay, Anand, remember, go ahead. Yes. 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 So, in case of John, you 
want to give a break and just forward what they have to answer. That means he didn't judge them. Yeah, so I mean, what I was trying to say is we don't see that there are timings to uh, when God wants to do something, right? In the case of Jonah, God said, go and preach to them because he was ready to judge them. But it was conditional. If you repent, I will not judge. So Jonah's message was, and, and, and you find many examples of it, there, there is a warning that means if you don't repent, you will experience judgment, which means if you do repent, you won't have judgment. So they repented, so judgment didn't come. Right? But it's not the same as the question where if we pray collectively, is the answer going to be faster? So the situations are different. Are there limitations to faith? Yeah. So there are boundaries within which our faith will have to work. Yeah. So uh, we will cover that in a chapter that's coming up. I don't know which chapter, but it's, there's a chapter called Perimeters of Faith, the Boundaries of Faith. So there we will explain, like, this is what faith cannot do. You know, for, for example, faith cannot override the will of God. Faith cannot override somebody else's will. Like, I cannot control somebody else through faith, you know? So these are things faith cannot do, and that's that's something. So within that, we have to learn to... We will cover that in a separate chapter. Okay? Any other questions? Yes, print, uh, Prince. Peter Shadow, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Prince question is, we heard about Peter's shadow healing. Can we expect those kind of miracles to happen today? The answer is yes. And much more. Right. Because with the way God works and you read about this in Haggai chapter two, I think it's verse seven or verse eight. God says the glory of the latter house will be greater than that of the form that means in in the expression of god's glory the the glory of the latter is always greater than the former so the early church is the former the beginning the latter the church of the latter days in our time towards the end is going to express greater glory than the early church so we can expect greater manifestations of the Holy Spirit, you know, so we should expect that. Oh, okay. So the question, uh, the question is, do these manifestations happen only for people who are called specifically? Or the answer is, God can use anybody. You know, he can use little children. Uh, he can use anyone uh, uh, to for these mighty manifestations to take place. Yeah, he can use them. All right, so let's continue with our... Um, discussion here on collective faith, and we'll also, in the process, answer Brent's question on, uh, you know, how... If, if somebody is in unbelief, would it impact others? So let's cover one more point here. Um, as you talk about collective faith, that even our collective faith can grow. That means as a community, our faith in God together can go to new levels. We see that in 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 3, Paul is writing to the church in Thessalonica. That means he's writing to this group. This whole community of believers, and he's telling them, your faith grows exceedingly. That means your collective faith is growing. Right? That means 
as a community, they are in a greater place of faith. And you will see that as you pastor people, you know, the people also grow in their faith. They grow in uh, their own spiritual journey. Now, I remember here at APC when we started, uh, in the early days, I did not emphasize too much on the Holy Spirit and so on. In, in, I think, uh, because we had people coming in from so many different backgrounds, uh, we slowly started teaching them. You know, And I remember those days when we would say, stay back for Holy Spirit baptism, one person to hardly anybody, because they're all afraid, you know, Holy Spirit baptism, what is this, you know? Many of the people came from traditional backgrounds, so they were not open to these things. But then today, you know, this the same church as a community, we are open. You know, we're open to the supernatural prayer, healing, deliverance, all these things. But it was not like this when we started 20 years ago. You know, people were not so open, you know, not so open to the gifts of the Spirit, not so open. They didn't understand. They had no knowledge. Um, but then it was a journey. Right? So today we are in a much better place, a place of greater faith concerning the things of the Spirit, concerning the prophetic and so on. So they come, you know, they come for weekend schools on prophetic. They come for weekend schools on gifts of the Spirit. They come for, you know, so, so, so much more openness and faith. They're a greater level of faith. So you see the whole community uh, moving in like this, right? So uh, people journey, you know, people go through their journey of faith. Uh, as they, you know, in, in different areas and so on. So as a community, we can, you know, grow in faith and expect more. So let's let's think, talk about uh, some of the destroyers of collective faith. So we are to be in a place of faith collectively, but what are some of the things it can destroy? Well, I just mentioned a few here. One is murmuring and Complaining. So if we start murmuring, complaining, you know, about each other, about things, it really destroys our ability to walk together in faith. How do we know this? You know, you look at this in First Corinthians chapter ten, uh, verses one through uh, twelve. You see, um, you know, that it's talking about the people of Israel as they were journeying together. And one of the first problems is they were murmuring and complaining. So he tells us, don't murmur and complain like those people. And they were destroyed by the destroyer. Yeah. So their murmuring and complaining caused them to be destroyed by the, the destroyer. It just, you know, God was working amazing things, but this is what happened. Another um uh, thing that destroys collective faith is competition and strife, right? So when we start competing with each other, you know, who is more spiritual, who is more this, more that, competing with each other, it just it, it destroys faith. Right? In fact, uh, in James three sixteen, when we are in strife with each other, uh, it opens the door to every evil work in our among our midst. You know, the devil comes in and he causes problems. So we should avoid that jealousy and strife and so on. Connected that to self, pride, and jealousy. These things uh, destroy collective faith. They, they don't keep us together. So anything that divides us, you know, will keep us from moving in collective faith. So it's so important that when we are together, at an individual level, we guard our heart, right? At an, because nobody can see your heart. Nobody can see, uh, you know, what's going on in your heart. But we are coming together to pray. So only you guard your heart when you come together to pray so that collectively we can see results. So as we minister as teams, we must learn to minister as teams with collective faith. You see this in the ministry of Jesus. When he sent his disciples out, very interesting, he sent them out two by two. He didn't send them one by one, like two by two, go together. Right? So you can imagine, you know, two, two of the disciples going together to minister. And they had to be in agreement. They can't say, suppose James is laying his hands on somebody. John says, hey, 
James, why are you laying your hand on him? You know, if they start fighting with each other, they're gone. They're not going to be able to minister to anybody, right? So they have to be in agreement. James and John, or whoever, going together, they had to be in agreement as they minister to people. So Jesus sent them out two by two, and uh, they went out and they ministered. So we also must learn, um, you know, uh, to minister together. You know how if two of you are standing and praying for somebody, you know you learn to flow together. You know, not flow against each other, but flow together, uh, and and minister together. That's something we need to be to learn, and we need to be trained in. Let me kind of do that kind of training. Uh, when when uh, when we now prepare for ministry, prepare for our mission trips. So, when ministering as a team, and even here, when you are. You know, as students, when you go out uh, to minister, learn to flow together. You know, respect each other. Okay, God is moving through that person. Let that person finish. Then I will step in after that person finishes. We are a team. We are together. We are not comp competing with each other. You know, so you flow together so that uh, God can work through us in when we walk in unity. Right now. We come to this next question, which Ren asked just a few minutes back. Um, does the unbelief of one person or some people affect the ministry of the others? There's the unbelief of one or two. In suppose suppose you have a group of ten people, example. Suppose eight people are in faith, but two people are not there. They're not in faith. Would the unbelief of the two hinder the faith of the eight? That's the question. Something like that. So that's the question. So let's look at scenarios. You know, so what 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 I've observed is what people do is they leave the two, say two of you, you stay here. The eight go by themselves and they pray. I observe that. Or sometimes it's the other way. The two people will say to the eight, eight of you are in unbelief. Two of us are in faith. So we will go and pray. You all stay here. I've observed that happen. The question is, is something like that correct? So look in, let's look in the New Testament. Right? What do we see in the New Testament? When you look at Jesus and his 12 disciples in the boat, I'm just giving different examples. Jesus and the 12 disciples. 12 disciples were in fear. 12 disciples were saying, we are going to sink. Jesus was the only one who was in faith. And he rebuked the winds and the waves, and they come. So question, could, did the unbelief of 12 stop the faith of one? Didn't. Another scenario. There was this lunatic boy who was lunatic, remember? Jesus went to the Mount of Transfiguration with three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John. Nine of them were left behind. So this father brought this, his son. Nine disciples could not deliver. Then Jesus came. And Jesus rebuked them, oh, faithless and evil generation. So it's like, what? And later on, when the disciples asked him, why could we not cast him out? They said, because he said, because of your unbelief. So they were in unbelief, whatever the cause was. So 
at least nine of them were in unbelief. Let's say only Jesus was in faith. I don't know about Peter, James, and John, whether they were in faith or not, we don't know. Let us not count them. Nine in unbelief, Jesus in faith. Did nine unbelievers prevent Jesus from his delivering? No. The boy was still delivered. So faith worked. Even though nine people were unbelief. Yes, see? And even when Jesus was ministering, other examples, when he was going to feed the multitude, five loaves, two fish, when he said, you give them something to eat first time, one is asking, which bakery can give so much bread? Another is asking, where can we get so much money? Even if the bakery can supply, how you'll pay the bill? This is the way they were thinking, the disciples. See, they were not thinking in faith. They were thinking, oh, how, where, which bakery, how much money? They were thinking like that. But did it prevent the miracle from happening? No. He said, you get what you have, five loaves, two fish, miracle happens. Peter, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. There was a boat with 12 disciples. Only one disciple had faith. 11 were saying, hey, we will stay here. You go. 11 didn't come out. Only Peter got out. And Peter walked on the... Yes, at, later on he got scared because he saw the waves. But Jesus held him up. But the point is, before he got scared, he was in faith. He walked on the water. So the unbelief of leaven did not prevent one from walking in faith and experiencing the miracle. Now, one of the common instances that people quote is about Jairus' daughter. You know the story, Mark chapter 5, Matthew 8. Jesus is with the crowd. Jairus comes and says, my daughter is sick at home. Come, you lay your hand on her, she'll be well. So Jesus is going to Jairus' house. There's a crowd with him. And in the crowd, this one of the show blood comes and touches him. And uh, what happens? Jesus takes only three disciples. Peter. James and John. He takes only three of them and he goes to Jairus' house. So now people use that example and say, look, uh, Jesus didn't take all the twelve. He only took three. So that means you only, only three of them were in faith, so he took them. Others were not in faith. Well, the Bible doesn't say that. So when you look at the ministry of Jesus, you find that there were times he took the three of these disciples because they were closest to him. Not because they were all in faith all the time, but they were closest to him. So he took Peter, James, and John. So in this particular case, the Bible doesn't say this, but the common sense conclusion should be, he left the nine to minister to the crowd. Because there was a crowd of people there. So, nine of you, you stay here, you minister to the crowd. I'll take three of them and go to Jairus' house. The Bible doesn't give us a reason why he took only three of them and didn't take all the twelve. It doesn't give a reason. But we have to come to a common sense conclusion. And you look at the full ministry of Jesus. He, there were times he took only three of them. He took only three of them to the Mount of Transfiguration because they were closest to him. In the Garden of Gethsemane, all the disciples were there, but he took three of them aside and said, you pray with me. Right? So even in this case, there was a crowd of people. So it is likely that he left the nine to minister to the crowd. said, Peter, James, don't come. We'll go to Jairus' house. 
he went there. And also, maybe there's a crowd there, so you don't want such a big 12 disciples coming into the house. All these practical things, right? So to jump, to use that as a conclusion saying, Jesus himself took only three because they were in faith. The nine were in unbelief. They were not in faith. No, you can't. That's not the right conclusion. That is not the right conclusion. Because they were with Jesus all the time, right? So, so my answer to the question is, when we are ministering, we are not, we cannot say that the unbelief of other people is preventing our faith from ministry. Right? That you go ahead and minister in faith, and don't say, okay. You know, you are not in faith. That's why the miracle didn't happen. Don't say that. It's wrong to say that. So, because you don't find Jesus ever turning around and telling his people that. So you minister in faith. You expect the results. And yes, there may be some people who are not believing. Or they are not there in that place to believe yet. But their unbelief will not prevent the miracle from happening. That's my conclusion from looking at all these examples. Go ahead, Anath. Um, we should not say that because we already know God's will. Hmm. See, it, uh, for example, if we are praying for healing, healing is God's will. Why? Because God said, I am Jehovah Rapha. So God is not Jehovah Rapha part time, and other time he is not Jehovah Rapha. No, he is Jehovah Rapha all the time. He is Jehovah Rapha to every human person. Otherwise, he would be a partial God. Right? He'd say, for you, I'm Jehovah Rapha. For you, I'm not Jehovah Rapha. For you, it's my will to heal. For you, it's not my will to heal. God is not like that. So that's that's a wrong understanding, right? So God's will, simple thing. God's will is consistent with God's nature and God's word. So we can be very clear about the will of God. If you know who God is, and if you know his word. Right? God's will is always consistent with who God is and with his word. That's his nature and his word. So when it comes to healing, what is God's will? It's God's will to heal. We don't even have to worry about it. When it comes to salvation, we know God's will. It's to be saved. When it comes to protection, it's God's will for people to be protected. When it comes to provision, it's God's will to provide because he said, I am Jehovah Jireh. See, that's his name. His name is Jehovah Jireh. He's a provider. So believe. Now, in certain cases, yeah, suppose you're thinking of whom to marry. You have four proposals. Then only one, you can only marry one. You can't marry all four, right? It's not, it's not, that's, that is not God's will. You have to choose one. So, there, yes, you pray, you understand God's will, then we move forward, right? So in those kinds of situations, our responsibility is to understand the will of God first. Because that's very personal, that's very subjective. It's for you, it's for you, you know, that is God's will for you. So you have to understand God's will, then you exercise faith. So in those matters, we can say, God's will is this, and not, it's not that for other things. Right? Um, for what you should do in life, God has a will or a plan or a purpose for you. So that you have to follow. We can't say, you know, somebody else's thing applies to you. Right? So in general, we know God's will by knowing God's nature and God's word. 
in specific things, who things like your personal things, you have to find out God's will for your life, and then you have to follow that. So two things. Okay. Is there a Kairos time for healing? Sorry? Okay, so so the question is, is, is there God's Kairos time for uh, healing, for provision, so on? So here's what we know, and this is 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 and 3. It says, now is the appointed time. Now is the day of salvation. Okay. So when it comes to salvation, God's time is now. Okay. So that word salvation is an all-inclusive word. It includes forgiveness of sins, healing, it includes deliverance, it's salvation. So God's time for salvation is now. Now is the appointed time. Now is the time for salvation. So when it comes to salvation, our we should pray for now. God, now. Okay? Healing, now. Deliverance, now. But when it comes to other things, other matters, yeah, you find out God's timing in the sense, uh, example, for your future ministry or, you know, or even money to do something, whatever, you know, God will orchestrate it, God will bring it together at the right time. Right? So salvation is now. That salvation, everything that is part of salvation is now. Other things you seek God for the right time. Okay, let me see. Good questions. Let me see any questions from the online class. Any questions from online class? Everything is okay? Are you all following? Okay. So let's go to, I think, the last section here on collective faith. And uh, we will close with this very quickly. So what happens or what should we do when there is failure in collective faith? Sean, what's your question? So um, can we say that um, if... If there's like two people out of like uh, out of ten who are uh, not no, not win the prayer or like uh, no like not uh, not who cause problems in the collective faith or who are not with the group of people to whom you're having a collective prayer with, um, like like as you said before, like if there are two people who are not in that faith and mm -hmm. out of the uh, so out of ten faith, people, yeah. two people are not in faith. Yeah. Okay. And uh, if those two people affect the faith of the others, so does uh, so does that mean that um, it's it's not it's not these guys' fault? It's their fault because uh, even though there are two people who are not in faith, the, the others can remain in faith. And I mean, so what we so what we concluded, Sean, uh, by looking at the ministry of Jesus is that as a team when you're ministering, right? So we're not talking about people who are receiving. We're talking about the team that's ministering. If there are people in the team who are not in faith, it, should, it will not hinder the people who are ministering in faith. So that's the conclusion we came to by looking at the ministry of Jesus. Because we find numerous examples where some of the disciples were not in faith. But yet it didn't prevent the miracle from happening. So... The conclusion we came to is 
if there are people on the team who are not in faith, it should not prevent the ones who are in faith from seeing results. We should still minister and see results. So it won't prevent. Your question? Yeah. So, uh, like you said, so if it by, by chance, if it like affects the other people because of these two, because of these two not being in faith, it affects the other people who are in faith. It does it mean that these people are not in the right faith, they don't have a strong faith because they're easily affected by these two who are not in faith? So you're saying if, example, out of 10 people, if two are not in faith and the eight people get pulled down by the two, uh, so does it mean that the eight are, what was your question? Does it mean that the eight's faith are not strong? or Does it mean the eight are not strong in their faith? Yeah, they're not strong in their faith. They got pulled down by the other two. Right? So all of them need help. So you can't blame the two. You can't blame the two are not in faith. You can only uh, if the eight fall, if they eight, like got pulled down because the two. It's not the it's not the other two person's fault. It's just the eight people are not in strong faith with God, right? Well, see the thing. Uh, I think we shouldn't waste time on something like that. What we should do is help all ten of ten of them right, to strengthen their faith. And one of the things we must learn to do as a team, or we must learn not to do as a team, is not to blame people. You know, uh, because we are working as a team. We either win as a team or we fail as a team. So, example: if two people are not in faith, eight are in faith, and you see a miracle, all ten must rejoice together. You know, it's not like the eight say it happened because of our faith in you two guys. You're, it's not for, no, no. Ultimately, it's God who works. So we should not, in our mind, at any point, think like that. You know, that's one thing we should. We are a team. We win together. We fail together. Right. So we, you know, uh, don't even blame anybody for anything. You know, we don't do that at all because we win together. We fail together. If we fail together, then we should work together to become stronger. Right? Don't blame like two of you pulled us down. Uh, that's not that's not good team spirit. Yeah, we don't do that. We never talk like that. Uh, we win together. We fail together. We fail together. Let us together become stronger. Let us together grow in faith. You know. So yeah, we should have that kind of a mindset. We had to get okay. Let me okay. A lot of questions we have. Uh, <laughs> we're already over time. Okay, um, what we're gonna do is this you can hold your questions for next week, write it down. Okay, we will come back to this section on overcoming failure in collective faith. So, we'll talk more about this. Uh, we will begin next week by with your questions. Don't forget your questions. Okay, so Ren has to ask question. Rimmel has to ask questions. Who else has questions? OK. So at least two questions. Don't forget your question. Please ask your question next class. And then we will finish this chapter. Same thing with those of us online. Please feel free to ask your questions. And you know we will uh, complete this section on collective faith and, uh, and learn how to be in this together. I'm just going to quickly pray. We just have less than a minute. And we will close this class. Father, we thank you for things we could discuss and learn and understand, increase our understanding, help us to grow in faith, and collectively, Lord, be a blessing in our world. In Jesus' name, amen. OK, thank you, everyone. Thanks for being on the class. And uh, we'll continue this next week, uh, answer more questions. Thank you. God bless. Bye now.